man in the room. <laughs> well, I don't remember earlier there was an issue with the web stream. On yours. Oh, on yours. Somebody hacked it. Karma. Mm -hmm. You realize that Elmer's monitoring his own Slack. So if you jump into Slack. Really? Yeah. So if you jump into Slack. It's great room. that they said that because my phone was like half an hour long, so if you cut it off, <laughs> it's perfect. There you go. <laughs> Okay. It's being recorded now. It it really is quality and not quantity of attendees. I do feel like I'm gonna be talking needlessly loudly for a empty room and then a large empty room. You guys can move down. It's better a large empty room than a small crowded room, I'm sure. I think maybe. If we were all in a little conference room, it would be, it would be worse. <laughs> little four-person conference rooms, little study room. I was in a room, presentation earlier that was literally standing room only. Was anybody else in that one? Mm -hmm. With room. The kind of the ambush. Yeah. Mm. Teaching legal tech by context, ambush, and mm -hmm. design. Yeah. Literally standing room only at Cali presentation. This is the opposite of that. <laughs> I once gave a lunchtime CLE at my law firm that nobody showed up for. But it was simulcast to all the other op offices, so I had to do it anyway. <laughs> Did anybody show up at the other offices? <laughs> As theoretically, lunchtime theoretically there were people in Palo Alto on the, on the line, I was told. So uh, you know, it wasn't like it was my idea. It wasn't like I raised my hand and said, Oh, can I please talk about settlement agreements and technology disputes? You know, right? uh, but nevertheless, so I was like, fine, I did it. Whatever. All right, speaking of fine, I did it, whatever, we should get started. So for those of you that don't know us, we're Sarah and Craig. I will let you from context decide who's who. Um, we are the currently the associate directors, soon to be co-directors, allegedly. Of the LLI, L, I can't even say it, of the LII at uh, Cornell Law School. So I will not read you my slide, uh, but I will say we would not be the spiritual successors of Tom Bruce if we did not have at least one reference to or quotation from the performing arts world. So I saw a, uh, a quote on the way down here, and anybody, anybody fly United on the way down here? There was an interview in the In Flight magazine with Alan Alda. <clears throat> And he was saying that he did not personally see MASH as an allegory for the Vietnam War. Um, it had just sort of never occurred to him until people started asking him. And he said instead he thought it was an allegory for all war. And that the way to be general was to be by being specific. Uh, and I thought, hey, that's like, that's like my Cali presentation, which I swear was done when I was down here. Um, and so really kind of where we're going to get to in the, in the course of the next, I will say, half an hour, 40 minutes, is uh, we're going to sort of end by talking about uh, what all of what we're doing specifically now and hoping to do in the near future says about where we think free law or where I think free law is going in general. So there's my requisite uh, performing arts quote. So this is the this is the four uh, the, the roadmap for the uh, the presentation today. I'm going to talk about two. Uh, original content projects that we've got going on. Sarah's going to talk about what's going on on the technical front. Uh, then the big announcement should probably be in uh, quotation marks, uh, but we'll share with you the big announcement. And then, uh, as I said, by way of summation, I will talk about what I think the, uh, what we're doing now portends for the future of free law in general. So starting with the original content. Uh, two things I want to talk about today, uh, the Women in Justice Project and something called Rio. For Women in Justice, uh, just three slides talking about uh, where it's coming from, where it is now, and where it's headed. So what this thing is, is this is a database that uh, came to us from another center at Cornell Law School in what, like 2009, 2010, Avon made a multi-year grant to Cornell to open a, women, a, a center for women and justice, the Avon Center for Women and Justice at Cornell Law School. It was a fairly typical, as I understand it, law school kind of center 
where you know they, they had some faculty involvement and some scholarship and they hosted a lot of conferences and and seminars and did some judicial training uh, but then one of the other things they did was they started a uh, database of case law international case law summaries summaries of international cases uh, that dealt with issues that fall into this large uh, category of, of you know women and justice issues uh, and then uh, I think that that grant was was renewed one time and then there were some changes in leadership at Avon and Avon decided they weren't going to give any more money to this thing and so it just went away and as it was going away the dean came to us he came to a lot of different people in the law school to try to save different pieces of it and he came to us to save this database uh, this case law database so we inherited it took it off the law school's web presence, put it, made it part of the LAI website. Um, and so that's, that's its present. Pretty well see what that looks like, I guess. And you can see just briefly from the topic, some of the stuff we're talking about. Abortion and reproduction, acid violence, custodial violence, divorce, uh, dowry related violence, uh, employment discrimination. So everything, you know, there's a lot that, that fits in this women and justice. Uh, world. The first thing that I had to do uh, was find somebody, and it, I should say it presented sort of two sorts of challenges. There were the technical challenges of, of taking this database that was designed by folks that weren't necessarily experts. In fact, I know for a fact they weren't necessarily experts because one of them was my law school classmate. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and get it up to speed and get it over on, on, uh, on our site. and. You know, Sarah's team did all that quickly and expertly, uh, as would be expected. And I don't think that's even really interesting enough to to have ever been a, the topic of any presentation, much less a Cali presentation. But I, I had a more interesting challenge, which was we weren't just going to put all this stuff up there and freeze it in time. If we were going to take this thing on, we were going to continue to add case summaries to it and grow it, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to find somebody to actually do that work. Um, so I actually contacted the aforementioned friend of mine, who was one of the first Avon Center fellows. Uh, and asked her if she was interested. She gave me the name of, of somebody else. Uh, and, and we hired uh, this woman part-time. Her name is Jocelyn Hackett, and she's amazing. And she runs all the editorial side of this. She's got pro bono lawyers at two or three huge international law firms, White and Case is one of them, for example, that are writing, finding these cases and writing these summaries of these cases. She's running a, a crew of six law students this summer that are doing, uh, doing various things. Uh, in the in the database, and uh, and so that's that's making it run, and that's growing the number of cases that are in this thing. But what's really the most interesting thing about women and justice that makes it worth talking about is not the fact of what we're doing now; it's what we're going to be doing. So on this slide, I mean, who this is? Where are my law librarians? No law librarians in the room at all. A couple, okay. This is your honoree, this is your international uh, law librarian of the year honoree at Cali this year. This is Maria Badeva Bright. Um, she is at uh, African League, and she's a longtime friend and collaborator of ours. She used to be at Safley, South African League. She's now at uh, African League, and African League uh, has some relationship with a unit at, the, uh, at Cape Town University called the DRGU, Democratic Rights and Governance Unit, right? DRGU. Uh, and so I always pull the hard duty which for at LAI, which means I had to go to Italy in October. And at this, con at this conference in Italy, I met up with Maria and I said, we're doing all this, all this international case law. A lot of it's coming out of Africa. Is there a way to collaborate? And she just started rattling off all the things we could be doing together. Um, and so I, I put our editor-in-chief, Jocelyn, in touch with Maria, and they just took the ball and were running with it. So now I've got law students set up to be remote clerks for judges in Africa. Uh, we are building, along with them, I've got students building a, uh, a new joint South African Supreme Court case law database. And a lot of the student work is about making sure that the taxonomies that they're using at, at Safley match the taxonomies that that we have in our database and that sort of stuff. Uh, so just this really cool, uh, in my mind, really cool way of taking this thing that we were given that was this sort of moribund 
summary of case laws and we've kind of turned it into a program with all these opportunities we're going to start hopefully sending students to Africa to actually see some of this stuff happen on the ground um, we're supporting these students these Cornell students are supporting uh, judicial training in Africa not just remote clerking but judicial training in Africa on uh, gender equity issues within the judiciary uh, which is something that the DGRU is is uh, is doing uh, at an academic level. So just all these sort of crazy things that a year ago we had no idea that we'd be doing that because we know Maria, Maria knows these other people at DGRU, there's now just these tons of opportunity for these, these Cornell students that are interested in these in this host of issues in this part of the world uh, to, to really get involved and, and really do what I think is unique and, and, and impactful, hopefully impactful impactful work that goes far beyond just sort of, you know, adding cases to a database. Um, so the thing I want to talk about is real. Now I was telling a couple of folks before we started that I have to give this five minute rapid fire talk uh, at a conference in New York City on Monday and I'm talking about Rio. So I've, I've actually taken those slides and put them into this brief so you don't have my welcome, my fancy welcome to Rio title slide. but. Uh, Nevertheless, you'll notice a slight change in format of the slide because, like I said, I just imported that deck into this uh, into this uh, Google slide deck. So when we talk about Rio, we're not uh, oh, this isn't working anymore. Awesome. We're not talking about uh, the lovely city in Brazil. We're not talking about the breakout 1982 Duran Duran album. And so many of us know it loud. And sadly, Tim's not here. But we're not even talking about his lovely dog with. His 5.2 million Facebook friends. This dog has 5 million Facebook followers. Um, he did, he's earned every single one of them. Uh, we are, in fact, talking about this Rio. Uh, this is a live URL. Anybody with a laptop right now could, could go there and see that I'm, I'm not making this up. This is a real thing that's on the website. We've had it a while. Haven't really talked about it much. Haven't really showed it to anybody. Haven't advertised it. Haven't bragged about it. Um, we're not 100% ready to do that. Uh, can be a little, little quirky, and uh, more importantly, we want to make it better. So the whole reason I'm giving this talk on Monday to a room full of uh, legal aid lawyers uh, in New York City is because I want their feedback on what else we can do with it. Let me tell you what it is. Um, so what this is, you can enter any citation to any published opinion in the search box and press link to this citation. And you get an eye chart. I'm actually going to break this down into two slides, one above the blue line, one below the blue line, so you can see what, what's on here. The first thing you get above the blue line is you get a universal citation to a bunch of places uh, where your case appears on the internet, both free and paid sources. So now you can take that citation and you can put that citation in a blog post or an email or an e-filing if you're in a jurisdiction that encourages citations in electronic filing uh, and uh, then that allows the recipient of that URL to choose their preferred source to read that case and so that's what was below that blue line on that last slide were all the different uh, all the different sources. So right now we've got for Supreme Court stuff we've got our own uh, Scholar and Google search which of course opens up a whole bunch of other results besides the actual case itself court listener Justia case text um, and then we'll talk about the, the, the paid side in a second now this is where I'm going to do a, a 15 second plug for Justia in my presentation on Monday anybody who's not anybody in this room who's not familiar with everything that's available with Justia. The 15 second version goes something like, so the citation I put in is DC v. Heller, the landmark 2008 Second Amendment case that we all know and probably don't love. Maybe we do, I don't know. Uh, but not only on the Justia site, not only do you have the syllabus, the opinion, the dissents, uh, you've got this lovely attorney authored annotation, case summary. You've also got, from Oye, which Justio, by the way, also runs, you've got all the audio, you've got the oral argument audio, you've got the, the, uh, the reading of the opinion audio that the court does, uh, and you've got the procedural history. So just tons and tons and tons of information on this free site that goes just beyond the actual opinion. So there's my 15 second pitch for Justia. Now the pay side. 
Lexus West. Why would we be doing this? Um, let me put that aside a second and say, based on two very productive meetings over the last month or so, I'm optimistic that we're going to be adding fast case to this pretty soon. And even better, uh, I'm actually hopeful that what fast case is going to be able to do, unlike West and Lexus, is provide a link that is publicly available so that even if a person, a user, does not have a FastCase account, they can click into FastCase and see this case. We will, if we're able to do that, we will have to find some way to put that in big flashing lights so that, that people understand that, that they can use that. Lexus and West, obviously, that link um, would allow a person who has an account to go straight into that, uh, into that opinion, in that service. I am wondering a little bit about for people that are paying by the search, what that will look like, mm. but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, I'll find I'll find somebody that can help me figure that out. I'm sure. Uh, but then why why would we why would we put the paid people in here? And that goes to uh, the reason that Rio came into existence in the beginning. Uh, Rio was the uh, the vision of Peter Martin, uh, and what Peter was seeing in his post-retirement academic research was an increase in the number of courts that were uh, recommending or allowing e-filers to include hyperlinks in their court opinions, or in, uh, in their uh, filings, right? Uh, so I'm a litigant in federal court using PACER. Uh, so here's Southern District of Illinois, for example. It was the first one that came up in, in, my, in my search. Uh, it says, uh, you can see it highlighted there, that uh, e file documents can contain hyperlinks to locations on the internet for source documents to citations. Uh, so if, you know, if you're in the Southern District of Illinois and you know that while this is a may, it's really kind of more like a should because certain judges uh, actually are now expecting these things or you're just trying to get in good with the clerks or whatever. Um, that's a thing. It's also a thing in, in state courts. This, again, just by random example, is the uh, website of the, of, of the Court of Appeal of the State of Arizona that says uh, RCAP 4.2e, whatever that is, encourages parties to include hyperlinks in their appellate filings. Uh, so, okay, now where does that leave you if you're a litigant in the Southern District of Illinois and uh, you don't have Westlaw? Because you know that's the preferred source of every federal court. I, I think it's a national contract, right? Um, every federal court uses Westlaw. So if I'm going to put hyperlinks in my brief, they probably ought to be to Westlaw. Do I then need a Westlaw account? And that's why Peter wanted to build this thing. So the answer is no, I don't need a Westlaw account. I can put the citation into Rio. I can get my, uh, I can get my universal link. I can put that in my brief. And then the court can... Uh, can read the case in Westlaw or anything else it wants to. Uh, and even, this is a slide from my, from my New York brief, uh, even very slow and staid New York State has a pilot program on uh, e-filing. I have no idea what the rules in South Carolina or any of the neighboring states um, in terms of uh, hyperlinks in, in, in e-filed briefs. I don't even know if South Carolina state courts do e-filing, come to think of it. But, uh, Anyway, so there's that link that will allow, uh, allow folks that say aren't Westlaw users to provide federal courts a Westlaw link. Uh, and then they'll, they'll be able to come in here and, and get, their, get their Westlaw link. But what's really uh, kind, of, kind of like, it just occurred to me, kind of like Women in Justice, what's really interesting here is not what it is now, but what we're hoping it can be. So I just want to briefly talk about uh, the future of Rio. And, and again, as I mentioned, this is what I want the room full of New York lawyers to give me feedback on on Monday. <coughs> um, and what I'm thinking about first is unpublished opinions. Mm. Uh, I think in this room, probably everybody's aware of what I'm talking about. Who has them? Well, mostly just Lexus and West, right? Are they useful? Well, that depends. And I knew from a class I took from Peter Martin years and years ago, that there were different citation rules in different jurisdictions. I didn't necessarily realize how, how broad the range is. You would think it would be kind of binary, right? Either cite them or don't. Uh, the federal rule, for example, is you can cite them, they just have no precedential value, right? Uh, I looked up, <laughs> literally, um, 
an hour ago, I looked up the South Carolina rule. Um, the South Carolina rule, if I understand it correctly, says they have no precedential value and you should not cite them unless they, at the appellate level, unless it is a history of the case kind of thing, right? Um, what's the rule in New York? <laughs> New York has no rule. So there's literally nothing in the books that tells people whether or not they can be citing unpublished opinions in New York State courts, which blew my mind when I went looking for that piece of information weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks ago when I put these slides together. Uh, the California rule is thou shalt not. Um, and the, the appellate courts actually uh, honor that rule. And the appellate courts, I, I tried to catch them on it. I went into fast case and I did a search for the, you know, the, the whatever the Cal app, unpub, Lexis uh, citation is, proprietary citation is, and got, I got 43 results and they were all law of the case things. You know, this court has already ruled in an order dated such and such, you know, with the, with the citation that published, but I didn't see any sort of precedential substantive citations anywhere in the California appellate body of law. Um, and I picked California, by the way, because I'm still a, a, a barred California lawyer, so I sometimes know those rules. Um, but this is cool. This is federal court. This, I picked this. Uh, you guys can't see it back there. But this is District Judge Sotomayor from several years back, 1998. Uh, and what this is, everything in yellow, which you can see even if you probably can't read it, these are all uh, parallel citations to unpublished Lexis and West opinions. And what she says is lots of courts have dealt with this issue. And she just lists them, page after page after page. And the great thing is, there are probably a couple of opinions in this room uh, about the, the copyrightability of those proprietary citations, <clears throat> right? And I might be a little hesitant to go through on my own and do some sort of concordance of, well, this case in Lexis is this case in Westlaw. But once she puts them in here, they're fair game. Um, so what I want to do is just build a simple table. And these are actually the first four cases from that opinion. This is the case. This is the Lexus site. This is the Westlaw site. And so now, not now, but if I do that, then uh, I can put in the, West, the, the Lexus site unpublished and get the, and get the Westlaw site unpublished. That shouldn't be too hard to do, right? Uh, I got Fastcase pretty excited about this last week, or earlier this week, and so I think it's going to be even easier to do. <laughs> I think they're interested in doing it too. Uh, so that's really it on the, on the original content stuff until I, I come back around with my big picture stuff. So I'm going to hand over the laser pointer to Sarah to talk a little bit about what's going on on the technical side. Thank you. Anytime. And I get to hide when I, when I wish to hide, so it's just perfect. Uh, so one of the things that's very wonderful about coming to Cali is that there's continuity from year to year, and we see you guys, um, folks, every year. And at Cali last year, I mentioned that we'd been on the technical front and actually across the LAI quite short-staffed. Uh, we had empty positions. We were spending a lot of time in crisis mode and pretty much the emergency technical migration of women in justice and technical work on Rio were the only newish things that we did apart from all of the firefighting that we had to do just to maintain the, the site and the services that we were already offering. Now, this year we filled an empty fundraiser position, we hired a communication specialist, and in August we were able to fill both of our empty developer positions. And everyone really hit the ground running. And so, of course, the first thing that we did was to commit recklessly to <laughs> releasing the new US Constitution annotated by Constitution Day, which is September 17th. Um, did not give us very much time, but we did it. Um, and we also were well on our way to pushing a lot of new products and features that had been in our pipeline out the door. We we developed a new internal API and moved our biggest collections to a new search framework. We were making a lot of progress toward complete semantic web features like our legal dictionary and entity links. 
and we were keeping up with day forward accessibility compliance initiatives. And then, and this is a little awkward, but please forgive it. Record scratch here. Um, for those of you who <laughs> trying to trap me in this in this slide. Um, for those of you who are not 309 years old like me, um, I give you an XKCD cartoon to, to explain what that is. At the end of this past January, we found out that we were in scope not just for day forward conformance to WCAG 2.0 level AA standards, but rather for a comprehensive web accessibility remediation. And suddenly, instead of hundreds of pages to address very carefully, we had hundreds of thousands of, of web pages to deal with. Now, let me pause for a moment to be very, very clear about this. It's really, really easy to look at these initiatives and the volume of work that needs to get done and the nitpicky nature of some of the automated tools by which the work is evaluated. Um, that often will seem very disconnected from the actual user experience of someone, for instance, who isn't cited and is using the screen <coughs> to actually access the information. We had a little bit um, been in, in, in stasis on that front because we kept getting fan mail from people who said to us that the LIA was the only way that they were able as law students to access the federal rules or, or other of our collections that they needed for school. Um, but even though it's very, very easy to complain about those things, it's not really to the point for us. LIA's mission is to help people find and understand the law and free access to law, if it means anything at all, includes accessibility by definition. Okay, so end sermon. Um, we have been breaking down the very large volume of work, um, and you can see on the screen that we are, just to, to keep it reasonably short, um, dividing things up among the, the, skin of the, the skin of the website. We are fortunate to have some help from our parent institution on, on that front. Um, the content of all of our collections, to, collections of PDFs, and then images. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on images. Um, when we took on republishing the Code of Federal Regulations, and this is at the beginning of the decade, we didn't quite realize that we were signing on to be republishers of more than 15,000 images. Now on the federal government's website, there, these images are presented in native format. They are also offered in PDF format, but that can often be an image PDF. And the annotations of these images on the, on the website say ECFR graphic, and then they give a file name. So this approach tells the automated tools that each image has a unique annotation, but it doesn't provide any usable information from our point of view about the image. Now the image types are all over the place. Uh, there are equations, there are diagrams, lots of diagrams. There are forms and tables and labels and logos and even maps. Um, and very presciently, the organization public.resource.org had started a couple of years back to convert the first two categories, math and diagrams, into machine readable formats. And they made those openly available on the web when we found out we needed to do a comprehensive remediation. We contacted them and they, and they said, yes, of course you can reuse them. Uh, and not only that, we will convert the rest of them for you. And that was a, a pretty lucky break um, on our part because their contractor, Point B Studios, has really extraordinary expertise in conversion of, of these formats and creating sorting and workflows and production processes that are quite efficient. Um, in addition to that, we hired undergraduates to write annotations to images that didn't have them. 
and law students to research the availability of born digital versions of image content that have been published otherwise on the federal agency websites. So at the end of this process, we will have most likely the only fully accessible version of the CFR. Um, this, has, this project has given us the opportunity to extract more structured data and republish it in schema.org format to make it more discoverable uh, across the web. It's expanded our horizons about the types of data we can analyze. We really did not do all that much with pictures apart from OCR them back in the day, and now that is something that we are a lot more comfortable working with. And it's also helped us find possibilities for new features to develop. But the timeline for completing this work was imposed on us from the outside, uh, not unlike the timeline for the women in justice migration being imposed on us from the outside a year ago. Um, and when those things happen, it means that we have to put up, off other kinds of feature development until these projects on, that are on their emergency timelines uh, have been completed. Sorry about parallel citation. <laughs> um, and also, even if that hadn't happened, we are very keenly aware that we have a lot of responsibility because a lot of people are relying on the current services that we're providing, and we have to maintain them at a level of quality, at the level of quality that they expect. And that is always going to be in some tension with the kinds of innovations that we are interested in exploring and want to use to bring even more valuable services and features to the public. Um, so we are using the occasion of Tom Bruce's impending retirement uh, to help shift that balance. And the big announcement is that we are starting a fellowship program hmm. Um, dedicated in, in his name. Uh, it will provide a stipend for a fellow to join us each year. We anticipate that this will usually be during summer months. And the fellow will explore new technologies and techniques of potential application within legal informatics, computer science, or legal tech. Um, and we are using this as a stepping stone to provide a foundation for us to make sure that over the long term, we are giving ourselves the breathing room and the opportunity and occasion to provide dedicated focus to things that might otherwise be neglected in, in the rush to fulfill all of our other responsibilities. Um, and so now, Craig, I'm going to turn it back over and you can talk about future ideas. Hey, was anybody at Ben Chapman's talk this morning? Because I'm thinking about applying for the fellowship to get a stipend to go do his summer boot camp in calculus and oh, computer yeah, science. Six <laughs> <laughs> six so then you get his LLM and become a legal analytics guru. So the future via summation, good lawyer word. Uh, like I said, uh, the the Alan Alda quote on the on the way down hit uh, rang true to me because. Um, as I was putting these slides together, we, again, weeks and weeks and weeks ago, um, as I was putting these slides together, I got to this point and I sort of realized all of this stuff had a common theme. And not only was it a common theme, it was a very familiar one. Uh, because I gave this talk at the CaliCon in, in Atlanta that was so spot on that I'm actually reusing the slides for this last little bit. <laughs> Um, some of the slides from that talk. Um, and so what I asked in 2016 was, what do these three things have in common? This is a World War II era merchant ship, a zebra, and Tom Bruce. Hmm. And the answer was, and still is, that I took each of these photos from a group shot. So there's that, there's that, that ship sailing in a convoy uh, which, which was a tactic that was developed to avoid uh, German U-boat sinkings in the Second World War. Uh, there's the zebra, which was taken from a nice shot of a herd. I think zebras travel in herds, right? They don't have some fancier name, like, a, like a, what's the ravens one that everybody loves? A murder, murder. A murder of crows, right? Um, anyway, I think it's just a herd of zebras. 
and it's too late in the day to worry about it. And of course, the photo of Tom that was taken <laughs> surrounded by, uh, by his colleagues uh, at Cornell and at Just. Yeah, I will point out two things from this photo. One, there's that, uh, there's that dog again. Yeah. Yeah. And two, Sarah said she could hide when she wanted to. Yes. <laughs> so, right there. so thank you for that. Uh, give me an extra, extra point of pride in the, in the brief there. Uh, what happened there? It's a blank slide. Neat. Um, and so what I said about this uh, three years ago was uh, it's, a, it's a big tent, and it's going to take a big tent for free law to continue. Uh, you know, that we, we had to continue to identify everybody that was doing this work and make sure that they all felt welcome and part of the collaboration. Um, and that was on the occasion of Oye, uh, which I actually spent all lunch talking about um, how, that all, how that all came to pass. I, I guess he missed that talk three years ago. Um, but anyway, uh, because the thing about ships and zebras and, and old free law guys uh, is that what we generally tend to associate with them when they're left on their own is they get sunk or they get eaten or in the case of old free law guys their work goes into an end of life notice because there's no, you were just saying right, that the, the Rutgers and the state supreme court right? They come. These, these, uh, these, these, uh, these, uh, these, these folks retire and there's not necessarily somebody to pick up the torch because they didn't have that built-in group of, of uh, they didn't have that built-in succession plan, right? Um, but what I said three years ago, uh, which I think we're now living in a lot of ways, is these aren't just surrounding free law with the group of collaborators and a group of the willing isn't strictly uh, a defensive tactic. Uh, everything we've talked about, not coincidentally, or I should say nothing we've talked about for the last <coughs> half an hour uh, is anything we're doing by ourselves, right? I talked about, I talked about the future of, uh, of uh, Women in Justice, which is all about the DGRU in South Africa and Maria Badeva. Uh, I talked about Rio and, and how Fast Case came just short of saying, we already have that correlation table, but it's pretty clear that if they want to help us, it, it won't take a lot of work on their part. Um, Sarah talked about both the university providing us some resources to make the skin of our site compliant. And she also talked about uh, publicresource.org uh, providing us the images, machine readable images. And this whole idea behind this fellowship is bringing in outside help, fresh ideas, fresh energy, fresh perspectives to work on some of the, the more cutting edge stuff while our regular crew sort of goes through. <coughs> all of the things the regular crew has to do to keep the site up and running and growing. Um, and so this was again a slide from, from three years ago. It's not just about strength in numbers as a defensive idea for free law. It's about this is how free law grows. This is how free law thrives. By bringing in other people, you get this, you get these, these, these uh, you know, fairly awesome, you know, this is my past life. I used to be on one of these things. Um, these fairly awesome displays of power, you get, you know, one of these, one of these animals is never going to take down an elephant, but maybe a dozen of them will. And uh, again, there's public.resource now as part of, uh, as part of the, the free group that sponsors this event, and lots of others along with us and Justia and Oye. And that was, again, like, as I was talking about all these things we're doing, I realized we're not doing any of this stuff alone. And uh, I think that's, that's the, the specific examples that, that uh, that lead to my general, my general hypothesis that uh, free law going forward is going to continue to be, at least from our perspective, a wildly collaborative operation, both within our group and with all these other people we talked about today, and other people in this room, and other people at this conference, and other people really around the world that, that all have the same goals and, uh, and all want to do this stuff, and it's going to continue to be all part of the Big Ten Revival. So it was a goal to be done a little bit early since we were the last one of the day. Uh, we're certainly available for questions from the group or, or all the folks watching from home on Slack right in now. Hi, Tom. Uh, I'm looking at the projector and not the camera. Hi, Tom. Uh, and uh, other than that, we'll all go, what is it, virtual zombie dodgeball, I think he said today, right? I don't think he was joking. No, I'm joking. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, he's not joking. Yeah, so we'll all go play some virtual zombie dodgeball. And, uh, and that'll be that. So thanks so much for coming, unless we have questions now.
you look like you want to ask a question, but don't want to be the first one. No, good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cooperate, we can all get out of here. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Zoologist watching from home. Well, it's a
So a great example. Forget about the theoretical stuff that hasn't happened yet. Let's talk about the real stuff that's happening on college campuses today. Facial recognition security. Right. right? I'm going to tell you right now, they all want that. Every single police security office at every university wants that. That is servers locally handling, you know, three gigabits of traffic, four gigabits of traffic, yeah. constant streaming. Yeah. They want that. Yeah. So maybe Maybe your system admin doesn't run your web server anymore. Right. Right? They just make sure you have a backlight like to do. Right, that's system admin. And, and maybe you've got a service contract for your your analytics, your edge right. analytics. But now you have cameras that you're doing. Like, so a lot of security cameras do edge analytics on the camera. Make sure it just doesn't happen. You can do some places for right. detection and stuff like that. But that's the trend. And obviously, yeah. that's where we're getting demand. Well, we're, we're getting demand from the, the police department. Yeah. They want, if they could, they would they they would give us a ban list, yeah, and we would have every single camera search for that ban list because they're worried they're going to have a lawsuit from the person on campus that shouldn't be. Right. The other thing that we do is that what I've noticed. We're we're talking about about this we're being recorded. Hello, we're all we're all the red slower. But the thing we're off there also look at that um, you know um, we seem to be inventing technologies and then bigging them up as something that doesn't really ever take hold in order to make work for people. You know, so, you know, years ago, it was a big thing. 
And that's not that was new shit. It was, you know, see multi repackages we need. Yeah, triples kind of a new concept, but not radically different from any of the way we looked at triple thread the way we did it before. Containerization, holy shit, you can throw a rock on any container based stuff a couple years ago. Yeah. That's a big list. I think that what's happening is an evolution of how you know you're, you're looking at the service and where does it make sense to, to land in that service. Right. And a lot of that is going to depend honestly on cost. Right? Yeah. Everything is going to be cost driven. People are moving to the cloud because there's the perception that it's cheaper. It's not, it never has been cheaper. I don't know that it would ever be cheaper. It's more predictable, kind of, sort of, you know. And, you know, you don't ever have to worry about mean failure ever again. You don't ever have to go to your management and tell her, tell somebody that this is five years out and I got a buying survey. Yeah. yeah. Just paying that. No, I, absolutely. It, it, it helps with your, your OPEX, your set of CAPEX. Right. Absolute positivity. It's, it's not a bad model. It's not a bad model, right? Well, it's not a bad model because, because, yeah, because at, at most universities, they get one-time infusions of capital and have no sustainability. Maybe what I refer to as surprise funding. <laughs> surprise funding, right? Yeah, exactly. Like surprise, you have funding. And then, the, then, then you go and you do work, and then you're like, okay, we're ready to spend it. Like, yeah, somebody else keeps the table quicker. Yeah. So when, when we said you had surprise funding, what we meant was whoever spends it first. <laughs> you were <laughs> surprise. No. No. For us, it's like you know, you ask, you ask, you ask, and you get, which is really, really affirming. It's one-time money, 90% of the time. It's not added to the base budget. So when I when I redo a classroom, I get, I mean, this is getting better, certainly, but I did 13 classrooms um, in one throw, one, yeah. one set of funding. That was really nice. Yeah. Uh, we were, at that time, we were at least 15 years behind in all 13 of those classrooms. Wow. And, uh, some of them were a lot further behind than that. We're at six years later. Uh, I only have about thirty thousand dollars identified at this point to redo a million dollars worth of. So, this is the, the it, it's probably not. It's probably more like seven hundred thousand, but right, it's still, it's it's a lot. The gap is still there. It doesn't matter. My input on all of the VC in you know, Apple TV. And that's, for us, that is pretty good. It's wrong. Yeah. Well, it's a good yeah. baseline. It's a good baseline. Okay. For our law school classrooms, for we all have some of the most, for our law school classrooms, we have some of the most, uh, I don't want to say complex, but they're, they're not an average classroom technology. So we got dual display, two two simultaneous sources, um, you know, cameras, and touch and uh, touch screen control interface, all that stuff. We have touch in the in the uh, non law classrooms. We primarily had like Extron IP, I don't know, whatever model number it is. It's just a push. It's, yeah, it's a oh, the punch foot, the. It, one it's, it's a button two. control. Yeah. You know, on off. They still had us control. Like you can still basically turn projector on off, raise and lower on, center right. inputs. Right, right. Um, That's like the class control interface for uh, x yeah. Super reliable. Of course. And then yeah. the um, the wall school we have mostly we have a lot of pointer touchscreens, but a lot of that is because the design of the rooms. So when we retrofit the non wall school classrooms, we already had boxes on the wall that were receptive to. Receiving the the extra push button stuff and not having much to do with the touchscreen because we didn't have the space like you, they, they do have the embedded touchscreens in the panel that you right. put on the front, but because of the depth requirements and everything else and the PoE you know, power right. and everything else, we didn't have the space. Whereas in law schools, a lot of what we've been doing is renovating right those rooms. We've been working out all the technology that was never used that we had. Yeah, and so these are good points. Right, assisted listening. Right. right. So we designers, we put assisted listening. Right. So we spend all this money. 
in 10 years of employment. No one, not a single person would ever. We're, we're obligated by the state and we have to have it. So what we did was we bought a external system. We have an external system we can plug into some random uh, okay. Right? And so it, we're like, if someone ever asks us, we'll walk into the room and we'll plug it in. And here's the thing, if you're a person and you know, like, you know, the, our, our exposure would be like, how many students would you have at the same time that might right. need that technology? Right? Because we, you know, we have to save it in a box or a box. You know, right. right? Oh, yeah, so we have all the equipment, we took it out because we wanted to simplify. So our rooms, we did these it's racks, like half, size, so right. half size racks yeah. that were completely full with all the equipment. And now there's a computer on the train, right. and then there's the Extron controller. And switcher scaler. Switcher scaler. Yeah. And that's it. Nothing else. Yeah. In the room. So we put blanks along the whole front, put the app TV in the back. Right, but we bought the Extrons, had the built in amp, we do HD 10 big T right. projector. So, right, we, we replaced systems that were originally $80,000 in a room with systems that were $6,000, $5,000 or $6,000. And, and so the benefit is, I said, I could, my budgeting is now so much easier. Yeah. Because I know that I can now budget this for a replacement. If I do this for a replacement, replace the PC, right. which is the really part of the three years, replace the other three years, and replace the other equipment. Seven. Every seven to ten, the Apple TVs have already done a replacement cycle. Are you running the 4K ones now? Or 4K. But you're not displaying in 4K. Uh, no, the projectors do, it, it's whatever the, the right, so the projectors are not, they'll, they'll do 1080p, but they also do, not 4K, but it's like an upscale. They do a higher resolution. Yeah. Same way you can buy that monitor that does it's still 60 by 9 or right. something like that. Right, some kind of a 2K thing. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Why are you But But again, but the thing is, is like, you know, we have a hard problem getting people to cali slides in yeah. 3 by 4 Yeah. <laughs> Was I the only person who noticed that? Mm. <laughs> you were the only person that yelled about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that you yelled about it, but. It, but it's like, that's the problem that we have. We yeah. have people who have PowerPoint slides that are literally 10 years old. Yeah. And they're still displaying. And they look fine, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but what has happened with you guys is we've got the ability to buy a slightly better projector. Right. Like, that's where we're really seeing improvement. People aren't seeing improvement because any of the stuff, the buttons, the old stuff worked. Right. You push buttons and it worked. The new stuff works, you push buttons and it works. So. Yeah, we didn't have that. We had the push buttons, but we didn't have any switcher scalers. We just had a cable that was extended from the projector to the wall. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, we have, we have now, switch when we spent our money, we, we put in some real switcher scalers, right. and poof, it works so much better. Man. You <laughs> right. the yeah. price you can yeah. plug in your laptop, and it'll display fine. As yeah. long as your laptop is not displaying higher than XYZ resolution. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's manufactured by this manufacturer. I mean, we had so many variables with that stuff. Yeah. yeah. But the one nice thing that you can do is by putting in a PC in the room, which is possible. No, we put PCs in all the rooms. The PC will work. The only problem we've had is the all in ones. Uh, we've done a lot of all in ones in the factory. I've never trusted my life to an all in one. Well, it's, not, it, it's, it's extremely problematic because we take the HDMI from the monitor, right? right. So it's just you have to do, right. and now it's in an exposed state. Right. right? So it's not like the PC that's racked in. Right, 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 right. Where you can't plug cables from the so back. So you're routing it. from the P from the all in one. The all in one is our classroom instructor PC. Okay. And it's going so you take the video the out. You have a video out port on your all in one. Sure. And you're saying that that connection is gets your tampered. Point. Yeah. That's our weak point because it's sitting on the desk. Yeah. I mean, we've had professors call us and complain when, when we have student workers walk over there and somebody has not or, or they moved it or what happened. The HDMI cables came out. See, we, we have smart screens in our classrooms for the, uh, on the... Oh, right, which are the, the computer display, but also the animation. Yeah, and we have RAP PCs that we have built and certified by Panopto. Uh, and our biggest issue is those things are on a mount, and people start to turn them and twist them. And the USB cable on that. No, it's not, it's not USB, it's the uh, uh, DVI, which is screwed in. Yeah. And they wind it up so tight, it breaks the board on the inside wow. of the display case. That's a $2,000 screen. So the first time it happened, I, I reported it to somebody. 
and it ended up getting to our police, our campus police, because I said someone vandalized the screen, and they're like, "Do you want to? Do you want to let us know?" Because we did it. One of our faculty members. You vandalized it, or well, it's vandalism. Tore up the screen. 